How do you go from this to an in-game asset like this? So that's the question that I want to find answers to today. How something goes from being a fleeting pot to being an in-game asset. And hey, who better to ask than the team working on the Division 2 that are regularly updating the game with new outfits. So I'm gonna grab my big boy camera and hear it from the developers themselves, starting with Palette. So apparel events are it's our main way of introducing new clothing into the game. So the clothing is a way for the players to customize themselves within the game, a way for them to add to whatever sort of personal fantasy they have uh, in their relationship with the game. And uh, when we do apparel events, we generally take a few outfits, so five, six, seven outfits thematically linked um and make them available uh, to the game for a period of uh, of about three or four weeks a lot of different uh, factors go into when uh, we decide on a theme for an apparel event um, it might be based on the other apparel events we've done recently so if we did one that was very paramilitary maybe the next one would be a bit civilian uh, if the last one had lots of blacks and grays maybe the next one would be a little bit colorful um, but we also sometimes look at the story and and what's happening in terms of the game story and the lore around it and if you look at the, the, the clothing we put in, in the game and, and weapon skins and other cosmetics, you'll see a lot of the, the, the game's corporate branding and uh, references to the factions and people and places. And all of this is very, very deliberate uh, on our part. For this particular apparel event, I'd been thinking about how, you know, because it takes place several months after a major catastrophe, no one's making new clothes. There's no laundromats. So realistically, everyone's clothing should look a little bit tattered and a little bit worn and, and a little bit filthy. And for the most part, the clothing that we give the people kind of reflects that because that's that's the story. But one of the things we have in the game is we have an enemy faction called the Black Tusk. And the Black Tusk are obviously well-funded. Their clothing looks very new. Their gear looks very new. It's all very, very high tech. So you end up with this dichotomy where you have the good guys, which are, you know, wearing, you know, dirty jeans and you have this high tech enemy. And I was thinking, well, what it would be like if, you know, the good guys, if the division agents had the same level of funding, they had the same level of technology as the Black Tusk, how would that look? And, you know, maybe we could sort of explore the, the relationship there a little bit deeper. So, and we've been playing a lot with adding more special effects and more lights and more animations to our clothing uh, anyway. So this seemed to be a good opportunity to sort of combine you know, that interest of ours to incorporate this stuff into the clothing and the idea of, of comparing the, the division agents with the Black Tusk. So I was like, I, I went to the concept artists and, and basically said, I want stuff that looks as cool and techy and modern as a Black Tusk, but it should look like division agent wear. That was the basic pitch. So when I received the brief, uh, I take tons of notes because there's a lot to keep in mind. And then I dive straight into research. And for this specific outfit, uh, it was mainly focused on uh, modern near future technology. During that, I collected a bunch of reference images and then I went straight to concepting. And for the Conley outfit uh, specifically, I mainly used the technique photo bashing. So the concepting phase is a lot of fun, uh, but you also need to keep in mind of the technical restrictions. So you can't go completely crazy. Then when I feel the concept is ready, I send it to Palle for feedback. And then it goes back and forth until we both feel happy with it. And then after that, I get to do a brief for the character artist who will then model it. In the case of this particular concept, uh, what Marie brought me was actually fairly well formed. She's been working for me for a while and she kind of knows, uh, she knows the brand and uh, is usually able to give me something very close to a finished quality often the first time I look at it. And that was the case in this one. There wasn't a whole lot of iteration on the actual clothing components, a little bit about some of the wires and details, but uh, it was one where the first time I had to look at it, I was already pretty excited about it. I thought it was pretty interesting and had a lot of you know interesting uh, details because again, we really wanted to dive into the, the, the tech side of things. And Marie devised this, this visor, this animated visor that I thought was really, really cool. And, and one of the things about doing cosmetics is you have to be really careful that it doesn't look like it'll actually do something. Like it has to be cosmetic. It doesn't have gameplay value. So what we try to do with the tech we incorporate is that it's something you can interpret what it does. It's not obvious. If, if it was obvious, then you would go, well, why doesn't it do the thing? 
um, because it's not obvious. You can go, okay, well, maybe this is night vision. Maybe this is something where a computer's feeding information via satellite. Um, it could be many, many things. And I liked that we got something that was gonna be an opportunity to you know, use an interesting shader and make it look cool, um, but it wasn't really obvious what it would do. The next step is it goes to the modelers. And what we try to give an entire outfit to one modeler because we want to make sure that the materials, the colors, the feel are consistent from piece to piece. So the same person that does the visor will do the jacket and the pants and the boots and so forth. When I get the concept, I'm going to start to do a 3D model. So a 3D model is usually is divided by a lot of stages. And one of the stages will be high poly stage. And at the end of the day, we will just going to get a really high dense, high poly model. That's why it's called high, because everything is going to be very like high polygonal and it will usually be like 20 million polygons for example. So when I finish the high poly model I move to the low poly stage and low poly stage is the stage of a process when you need to lower down the poly count of your high dense really insane detailed model so that in game it will run more smoothly and a low poly stage is also can be explained by actually doing the optimization. So we still need to make sure that it's run really good, but it has all the details. When that is done, we need to do the unwrapping, which is UVs. So UVs are made for baking and texturing. So without those, we can't texture basically. And after the UVs will be done, we go to texturing stage. Uh, on that stage, I add all the basic colors, uh, all the dirt, wear, uh, torn, torn kind of pieces here and there, you know. So everything that comes to textures, basically, and the color itself. When that is done, uh, I import all my textures and my low poly model to the engine. I've set up all the graphs, import the textures there, make sure everything is kind of looking the same. And when that is done, I submit my model to the engine and say, Pali, hello, <laughs> check out my model piece. So once it gets to the texture stage, which is the stage after low poly, that's when I start looking closely at it. Um, because that's when I can get a sense that, is it becoming the asset that I sort of expect it to be? Um, of course, sometimes they, they don't become the asset I was expecting to be, but I still like them. Um, but in this case, it was pretty much how I kind of seen it in my head. It was coming together very, very nicely. So uh, at that point, because we wanted to have uh, we wanted the visor to glow, we wanted it to animate, then it's a matter of handing off to a technical artist, in this case our, our tech artist Connie, uh, to bring that part to life. First thing I do with the asset is skin it. Uh, you need to consider what parts of the asset are allowed to bend and what are not. So if it, the vest has uh, maybe a magazine on it, uh, you make sure that that magazine is totally static and doesn't bend with the body. Uh, once it's skinned, I need to make sure that its locators are set up properly so that the vest can talk to the backpack and put the straps uh, where they're supposed to be so that they don't float and they don't clip with the body. It can sometimes be a sensitive process. The other thing I do is set up the colors. So I check the concept of the thing and I make sure that the colors uh, that the vests have are representative of the concept. After that is set up, I create a palette for it um, so that the item can be spawned in game and it can have its default colors. But when the players actually get their hands on it, they can also recolor it and put camo on it. Um, I keep my eye out for items that are supposed to move or shake. Uh, I'll give them uh, reflex, we call them, um, which is a physic uh, simulation. So the VFX for the Conley helmet uh, was interesting because when you first look at the picture, it's just a few glowing dots on the helmet. You can't really tell what is supposed to go on there. So we started with the basic of the static image. And then me and the 3D artist and the concept artist, we talked through it and we, we talked about what would be interesting. So we started doing some lights that were panning right to left. And I kind of felt like this is too little. So we started thinking, what if one line of the dots are going one way and then the other one are, are crossing it. So there's something more interesting happening. Once we got that far, it felt good, but the 3D artist felt like maybe there's some final uh, sherry on top that we can do. And we noticed these uh, spots on the concept that were like, couldn't those kind of spin around in a random fashion to make it something break the uh, repetition of the, of the regular movement? Um, so I added a, a rotating UV uh, to this shader as well. 
uh, so that we're using all three colors to create different effects. Once we have everything ready for the asset, uh, we've created all the physics we need and the shaders we need. Uh, we actually do a recording where we zoom in on everything, we run around in the game world to make sure that we catch anything that the player might notice that isn't really uh, on the highest quality. Uh, then we send it to my boss, uh, Palle Hofstein, and he's uh, gonna evaluate what he thinks and if he notices anything popping out. And after that, it's done. And then it goes, well, basically it goes into the game. Uh, at that point, it's, it's, it's pretty much done. There's still other stakeholders that need to have a look at it. We still need to take images of it for marketing purposes and, and video for marketing purposes and so forth. We have to name it, which is often fierce debate about what we should call certain things. Um, and uh, but in, in this case, it was interesting because uh, you know we were looking at these outfits as being representative of actual characters in game story. So what we've done in the past is we've had characters in game story, and we thought, okay, well, what would these characters look like? And came up with outfits that way. I think the Phoenix Down uh, Pearl event was done that way. But in this case, we started with the outfits first, and then I went to uh, uh, Lauren, our narrative director, and said, we have these outfits which of the division agents within all of the lore of the game could you imagine would be the one that would dress this way? And that's how we came up with the names. Well, there you have it. It's a long, complicated process with a bunch of steps and a whole lot of developers involved. And it's a process that's continually ongoing on a game like The Division 2. Now, if you want to know what's coming up next on The Division 2, make sure to follow their channels. And if you like the, uh, the different kind of tone here on the vlog, well, let me know. Or if there's something else that you want to learn about, I'm doing this all for you. See you on the next one.